This morning we chose an Old Testament personage to study and to see the good and bad points so we could learn lessons that are beneficial to us in living the Christian life. This afternoon I want us to turn to the New Testament and look to one whose name is Bartimaeus. And we might call him, when we were first introduced to him, blind, begging Bartimaeus. Children many times have sung a song about him from earliest on in their lives. And we want to see some things that can help us be better in service to our Lord that he shows in his character. First of all, let's note that Matthew, Mark, and Luke mention this particular person and the miracle involved with it, the healing of his blindness. Now, if you look at Matthew, he will mention two blind men. But Mark and Luke refer to only one. And Mark chooses to make reference to the more familiar of the blind beggars. And thus, he calls Bartimaeus by name. Now, as usual, those who want to try to find fault with the Scriptures come and they read their Bible where they look for only discrepancies. Of course, they can find none, but nevertheless, they go to Matthew and Mark in this case, and they say that this incident occurred when they went out from Jericho, Matthew 20 and verse 29, and Mark 10, verse 46. But now when you read what Luke had to say, he says it happened as they drew nigh or near unto Jericho, Luke 10, 46. Well, again, we know the Bible doesn't contradict itself or have discrepancies like this in it. So there are two acceptable solutions that are possible here. First, when you study about Jericho, you realize there was an old Jericho and there was a new Jericho. And it just may be that they contacted the blind men when they came to Jericho. But then the miracle occurred when they left old Jericho and they continued on toward new Jericho. Second, some have suggested that the blind men cried for help when Jesus came into the city. But they were not healed until Jesus and his following left the city. Either way you want to go, you have harmony in the scriptures. So I thought I would just move that out of the way before we get to the person, what we really, really can learn about him. First of all, we want to note that Bartimaeus was in a terrible condition. He was blind. He could not see anything with his eyes. And in those days, that was terrible, more so even than today. There was nobody, no government agencies, no things of that nature to help him. And thus, people like this had to resort to begging to survive. Now, no human being could really give him what no doubt he wanted the most. And that would be his eyesight. And I think in reading these accounts that our hearts are easily made to grieve over those who are afflicted with anything like this, but especially physical blindness. So what about our concern about those who have been blinded to the truth of the gospel? God's power to save them. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. Jesus uses the word blindness, talking about people who are blind to the truth. It's used in various ways like that in the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul describes the terrible ordeal or plight of many in stating that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving or those that believe not that the light of the gospel of the glorious Christ, who is the image of God, 
should not dawn upon them. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. So I know that I can become blind in a way that would be far worse than Bartimaeus. Because I can let the affairs of this present world, the secular and the fleshly, completely close my thoughts off from the invisible or the spiritual and that which is therefore abiding. And I can't even see beyond my death or I can't see beyond the end of the whole secular order of things and see the judgment. I can't see heaven and I can't see hell. And yet we're taught all the time that this life in the flesh on earth is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. It's all so very temporary. So very temporary. If you're looking for something that's permanent in this life, you won't find it. You'll find some things that will stay around longer than other things, but you won't find permanency. It's like it said of Abraham. He looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He looked beyond by the eye of faith, knowing faith comes by hearing the word of God. He looked beyond this world. He never expected to find that city with foundations, meaning it cannot be moved in this life. So we need to be committed to doing all we can to help those who have rejected the power of God to save them from sin, and that is the precious gospel. And through that gospel, their eyes would be opened to see their lost condition, and that's far more wretched than being physically blind. Next of all, we're mindful of Bartimaeus' inquiry. Seems to be rather an anxious inquiry. You know, he could hear and he heard the multitude passing by. And he asked, what does this mean? Luke 8, 18, 36. Now this tells me that while I might be limited in one area, it doesn't stop me from using what I have in other areas to perceive what is going on. Too many times today people are saying, well, I don't have this, I don't have this, no pity me, you know, woe is me. And let's all get together and have a pity party and never see anything. Never see a way out. Never see something better. And especially when it comes to saving your soul from sin and going to heaven. And so Bartimaeus demonstrates that one is acting responsible. Acting prudently. Even though tragically... He has such a handicap, I guess to be more proper today, uh, challenged, in that he cannot see. He didn't have eyesight. Have you ever got in your house and just, and that's the most familiar place where you move around, and just covered your eyes up where you couldn't see anything, not even any light. It's hard to do because... Uh, you can perceive light. There is therefore hope many times that you can get your sight back if you lose it, if you can still perceive light. But somebody that's really blind cannot even perceive light. So try sometime in the own familiarity of your house to cover your eyes up, or you, if you can, not even see any light, and then move around your house. Now that's the most familiar place I know to tell you to try to do that, or you might have some success. But we have all got up in the middle of the night and uh, suffered by stepping on this or stumping our toe on that and whatever else, and it's all because we could not see. And that's the way people are out here without the proper knowledge of the gospel. They stumble over this, they stumble over that, they get themselves into this and that, and none of it's good because they do not have spiritual eyesight. But he had ears and he had a tongue. And this man was rewarded by doing what he could, I guess we could say, to put his faith into action. All don't have the same ability. All don't have the same talent. However, 
all people who are accountable to God for their actions are responsible for using what talent and ability they have for the cause of Jesus Christ. I talked to the man recently. I mentioned him in class this morning. And he was doing his best to tell me, and claimed to be a member of the church, a gospel preacher, but he was doing his best to tell me that when you're out here in the world without the knowledge of the gospel, nobody's ever brought it to you, nobody's ever taught you, and he even went so far as many used to do, some deepest, darkest somewhere where nobody's ever been to teach of the gospel. And he wanted to say, no, there must be something that God does to, to save that person. And I said, you mean tell me he's not saved and he hears the gospel and then rejects it? Well, he didn't want to say that, but that's really where he was headed. So well, what do you mean? Is he not lost before the gospel gets there? I thought Christ said go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the consequences of sin is death. They're all separated from God. That's why we go preach the gospel to them. They're already law. Oh, I just can't believe. He said, Brother Brown, I just can't believe that you think people out there who have never been exposed to the gospel are lost. And that's when I told him, don't you know that at one time all of the world knew God and believed Him? Somebody had to leave Him. Now, that's not God's fault. And that God has promised, such as in Matthew 7, 7, if we want to find him, we can, and he'll make it possible. That's exactly what Paul said in Acts 17. He's not far from us. He wants to be found. He's made us in such a way as for us to use this world to find him. And I told him what you've heard me say in sermons. I said, you miss God in this life. You haven't used this life for what God intended, which is to find him and to learn the gospel and serve him. I said, the atheist out who says there is no God is going to give an account of why he was not in services worshiping God acceptably. Why well, he's not even a Christian, he said. I said, I know, but he's got to qualify himself. I don't know about this qualification. So well, let me ask you a question. Would you baptize a person who does not believe in Christ if he would let you? Well, I know. I said, why? But he didn't want to use qualification. <laughs> I said, all right. He says, I believe Christ as Son of God. But he's living contrary to God's will. I said, well, if he wouldn't repent of sin, would you go ahead and baptize him? No. I said, that's what I'm talking about, qualification. He's got to believe and repent. All right, let's suppose he's done that. But he will not confess Christ. Would you baptize him? Well, no. Why? Tell me why you wouldn't. You don't like qualification? So the question is, who's qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins? Is it the person who believes and won't repent? Is it the person who believes and repents but will not confess Christ? Or the person who believes correctly and repents and confesses Christ, is that person qualified to be baptized? He did not like the word qualification. He never did. Frankly, I don't know what to do with folks like that. Paul had a word for it when he ask the brethren to pray for them that they be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Do you realize the gospel was meant to be presented to reasonable people with honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15? And if you're not going to be reasonable, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. You know, that doesn't just apply to the church. That applies to everybody. How would you ever become a Christian if you don't think it through? Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Good being the gospel that you've learned and know that that's how it saves you. Fundamental matters that are his first principle as they get. And a man's been preaching, I guess you could call it a preaching of the gospel, because really he hadn't. And he believes that and he preaches all over the place. It just boggles my mind that on certain fundamental basic principles they don't understand that. Bartimaeus proves that if we will only properly use the faculties we have, we can accomplish far more than even we imagine when we use them to learn the truth and live it. Now, I would say the fellow I was talking to is terribly blinded. He's far worse off than Bartimaeus. He's blinded to the truth 
and no amount of me shining light on things because he wants to hold on to a certain matter more than he loves the truth is going to help him. That's where we are today, more in the church than we realize. So let's not fall into the devil's snare of saying, if I only had his ability, I'd do more for the Lord. Now, you know, some people, I think, have learned not to actually come out and say that in almost those words, but in their mind they're thinking that because it's a good crutch to lean on to justify yourself for not doing what you could do. Or maybe they'll say, if I didn't have this handicap, I'd be of greater service to the Lord's church. Have you ever noticed people that do have physical handicaps that they overcome those handicaps? And a lot of times they do a whole lot more than some people that don't have those physical handicaps because they want to. They have a zeal to do what they know they can do. And it amazes me. Don't you ever find yourself when you see some of these people that have had their legs blown off by mine and they've, got, they've been able to go through maybe two or three years or longer of getting adjusted to uh, prosthesis and so forth. Have you ever thought, what would I do in a case like that? I saw a picture of one man, he had both legs off at the hip and lost one arm. And you know, you're a young man when this happens. How that just totally changes things. And then you think about the determination of those people to better themselves. Well, think about yourself as a member of the spiritual body of Christ. We all have different degrees of knowledge and ability and experience and lack of it. But we do what we can where we are to the best of our ability. That's how you grow. A third point in Bartimaeus' his action is that it produced for him a blessed privilege. The Lord asked him, and think about this, if this is you, and in a sense it's happened to every one of us, but just think of this. The Lord asked him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Buddy, the Lord says, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What would you say? I think we would all probably say something to the effect, get me to heaven. And you know what the Lord would say? That's exactly right. And he saves the obedient. What would he say, in other words, that hasn't already been said in the Bible? It would be like asking Paul. Paul, is there something? I've read all your material. I've read it in Greek. I understand it in Greek. I understand it in English. I've looked at this and looked at that and studied all this. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say? You know what I think he'd say? No. <laughs> I've said it all. Because he wrote to the Ephesians saying, uh, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Well, why doesn't he still mean that? I don't care if it was written 2,000 years ago or not. It doesn't change the truth of what he said. So the importunity of this blind man had prevailed and Therein is a, le a lesson for us. What if Bartimaeus had remained silent, feeling so terribly sorry because he's such a terrible, blind condition? But he could speak, couldn't he? He could see, but he could speak, and he could hear. One cannot help but think of the Lord's admonition in saying, and we've already referred to it today, I think at least in class, ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and it shall be, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Then notice the promise. For everyone, anybody left out? For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened, Matthew 7, 7 through 8. But do you see, that allows each one of us then to put into it all of the power we have, mentally and physically, to seek the thing we want and to find it. And that's what God wants to see out of all of us. When you think about it, God made this world perfect for what He made it to be, a place to find God, learn the truth, and go to heaven, have our faith tested by the devil and so forth, learn to choose good over evil and reject the evil. When you think about this, 
that the proof of our faith and trust in God, a faith formed by thus saith the Lord, or our love of God, a love that leads us to obey Christ, what other way would a person who's a free moral agent be a free will? What other way could God set up a situation to where somebody like that could show him that you love him except by faithful obedience or loving compliance with his will? If you remove those two things from a person who has free will, how would you ever show God you loved him? You couldn't. You just couldn't. Artemis then made a very urgent and a specific request. And remember Jesus had said, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Luke 18, verse 41. And I suppose if I had been dumb or I had been deaf or I had been blind or all three, I could perceive the question from my Lord, I would have answered the same way. Wouldn't you? Surely the blind beggar had other needs. Well, you know he's poor. He's a beggar. But he didn't ask for great riches. It reminds us of Solomon, another one who started out well and didn't end up so well. And when God told him to ask, he asked for wisdom to be able to govern all these people. Wish we had some folks in higher places of government today who had that attitude. Neither did he desire for a position of honor and great power in the world. You know, that's interesting because two of those apostles of Christ, their mother came to him and said, can one sit on your right hand or on your left hand? But here's Bartimaeus who's blind when he says, what, what can I give you? And he says, I want to see so Bartimaeus' specific plea for, reminds us that when, when we are as conscious of our mistakes and frailties and sinfulness as he was his physical blindness, then I don't think we would fail to plead for the thing that is most needed in you and me. Forgiveness of sins, to stand pure before Christ, Reconciled to him, justified in his sight. That seems to me to be the thing any one of us would want. The lame man who begged daily at the gate of the temple was hopeful of receiving money. And Peter and John came up. But Peter told him, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Acts 3, 6. <coughs> Well, Christ can give us today and will to the end of time if we will commit ourselves to learning and loving His will and doing it, something that's far more precious than silver and gold. Salvation from sin. It's offered to us. The gospel's God's power to save. But it depends upon our using what we have as a free moral agent to learn and to comply with the truths that we learn. But with our faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that He seek after Him. Hebrews eleven six. Luke 13, 3. Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Then there's a confession of Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Matthew 10, 32. And then in the Great Commission in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. There's the example in the day the church started of those who were devout Jews, but Judaism was not going to save you any longer. You've got to embrace the gospel. So they were pricked in their heart by the gospel message that Christ was the Son of God. They cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, as believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Verse 47 says they were added to the Lord's church by the Lord himself. And as we continue down the road in the spiritual body of Christ, brothers and sisters in the Lord and the family of God, we continue to have forgiveness of sins 
it's available to every one of us as we keep a penitent attitude and a willingness to confess our sins and pray God for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, Acts 8, 22. There's that constant realization. I, in fact, let me back up and say it this way. As a member of the church in view of what all one goes through in the process of conversion to become a child of God, isn't there always in a growing, sharp consciousness of the need of Christ and His mercy and grace and His blood? Because surely we don't reach a stage where we think, I've got it made. I don't need anything anymore. I'm a member of the church. That sounds like the Jews born there's a seed of Abraham. You don't have anything else to worry about. Just go right on. That's not true. I think the people who probably are the most, I guess you'd say, touched by their frailties, spiritually speaking, before God and seek more to draw nigh to God are the people who have truly from the heart obeyed the gospel of Christ and been added to the church and are very aware of the need of the grace of the Almighty extended to us through the New Testament of Christ and the blood that comes to be applied to us. I, I, I don't know how else you would say it. Now, aren't we, shouldn't we be the ones most conscious of all of the need of the mercy of Christ? That's right. He said, have mercy on me. Uh, to the one who is a sinner, and it's his fault he's a sinner, he did it because he liked it, all you can cry out to God is, have mercy on me. And that ought to tell us, too, why we should be ready to forgive anybody else who loves, believes, and obeys the gospel as they seek the same mercy we all sought from God to forgive us. And then the last thing is Bartimaeus demonstrated his gratitude for receiving the Lord's blessing. Luke records, and immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise unto God Luke 18 43 we rejoice with people when they are obedient to the gospel when they're baptized into Christ because their old man's dead they're a new creature in Christ they've been added to the church by the Lord we rejoice with one another as we see people grow in greater knowledge and ability using their talents to further become useful in the kingdom of God. And it's also good to note as a side matter about miracles is that true Bible miracles were always instantaneous. It wasn't any of this, you're healed and then you struggle around for a while trying to do this or whatever else, it was your handicap. It's immediate. Bartimaeus didn't return to begging after he received his sight. He followed Christ. And he sought to glorify God. Today, those who die to their sins in repentance, having believed in Christ, confessed their faith in Christ, are baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. Galatians 37, in a different state, a saved state. You're in a lost state over here. You're out of water to the grave of baptism. You're in the church, a saved state, a different relationship with God, a reconciled relationship. We're in uh, newness of life. It's a different way of living. Romans 6, 4. No longer should a child of God be content to live according to the ways of the world. But the longer you live, the more you wish this old place of sin and the consequences of sin and where the devil has access to you is done away. And you don't want to even be spotted by the sins of this world. You long for a place where the devil no longer is. No longer a place for him to do his dirty work. No longer a place to be tried and proven. All that's passed away. I like what it said in the book of Revelation. The former things have passed away. They're gone forevermore. There will be no more place of proving. No more place of testing your faith. No more place like that at all. No more struggle. No more repentance. That's a wonderful fall. So for a little while, we continue on to study the Bible, to review our own lives, to bring ourselves in subject, subjection to it, and to reach out to teach others using what we have to grow in the grace and knowledge of God and teach the truth to others. I hope we can learn from the conduct, conduct of this uh, man who was a blind beggar.
It's amazing how the Lord in His infinite wisdom has given us these great characters to study. And look at the difference of the one this morning, Jehoshaphat and the position he held, how he started out and how he ended up, and then this lowly beggar and what he did that can teach us so much about becoming a Christian, living the Christian life, and being faithful to God. If you need to obey the gospel, this afternoon is the time to do it. And we certainly urge you to do so if you need. Or if you need to repent of sins, come confessing them. Now's the time to do that too while we stand and while we sing.